pick up whenever you want to. Oh. The ribbon drop business. Right. Um, it was known that Jackson would inter uh, be the first to introduce to cross-examine Gehring. Hess was not going to testify until the next man would be on ribbon drop. And um, um, Uh, somehow or other, Bill Jackson said, would you help my father get the documents together and so on, so he can do the second cross-examination of Ribbentrop. And I said, of course. <clears throat> so I gathered all I could that I thought Jackson might use, knowing that the British were going to have the first cross-examination. Right. And, uh, but that I thought we knew the documents better and that and so on, and that he would still have some basis for a good cross-examination. So I took all this stuff out to his home one evening after dinner, and Jackson uh, came uh, down yet on a bathrobe, and he seemed very uneasy, just nothing like what I'd ever seen him before. Mm -hmm. And uh, it obviously, it was the result of the f his feeling that he had not done well on the parts of the Gehring exam. Actually, parts of it weren't bad, but parts of it were pretty lousy. So uh, he uh, never even sat down, and he said, uh, Captain Sparker, I have decided that I'm going to turn over the cross-examination of Ribbentrop to Colonel Amon. And um, so I w would like to have you go there, and, but I did want to thank you for getting this all ready and so on. And I wasn't, I wasn't particularly friendly with Colonel Amon. Uh, for some reason or other, we was, had a stiff relationship. And I said to him, uh, Mr. Justice, uh, is there any chance that instead of using Amon, we could use um, um, God damn it, I had it in my mind, isn't it? Another uh, one of our uh, 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 senior attorneys, and he was rather abrupt to me and said, no, I've decided I wanted to have Colonel Amon do it. So I got out of there, and with instructions to go to the next day to Colonel Amon. Meanwhile, I thought, you know, I know Sir David Maxwell Fife reasonably well. Why don't I go to him and show him what we've got and ask him if the British want to see if they've missed anything, and then I'll go to Colonel <laughs> 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 Which I did. And by the time Colonel Amon was following uh, Sir David in cross-examining von Reventop, it wasn't much for him to do. <laughs> it had been so thoroughly covered. But he never knew what that I'd gone. I, I had. And they used a few of the documents that I had right. brought to the British. That was one of the. You know, you, you didn't feel at all disloyal, particularly about doing something like that, um, except that I did it without talking to Eamon. Because the, we were very close, really, the number of us uh, on the British staff and uh, the American staff. Um, and we would exchange things like that informally without any hoodala or any prior memos and so on. Was there much interaction at all among the French and the Russians and the Americans? Uh, the. With respect to the French, the French were really so understaffed and so busy trying to hold things together, they often weren't up to date uh, on things. What about the French staff and the Russian staff yeah. and the interaction? <clears throat> the, uh, 
I had uh, quite a bit to do with one of the uh, French prosecutors. His name escapes me right now. Um, and he and I worked on preparing the wrestling case, which is a case against one of the, the leaders of one of the three or four top industrialist concerns in, in Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. And we we're going to uh, indict them for spoliation of foreign property and slave labor. And uh, he and I worked very closely on that up until uh, he left to go and make and actually conduct that trial. Uh, I don't know anything about Jackson's relationship with the uh, head of the uh, the top people in the French delegation. With respect to the Soviets, uh, things were very distant and very reserved, and especially because of the Katyn documents and so on, they were very unhappy that we we uh, pursued an independent course. Uh, The, uh, the Russian chief prosecutor would sit at, at his table, and often not smiling, kind of, is it, and, on the, and the general appearance was, we don't care to have a hell of a lot to do with the rest of you people. So, yeah. you know, we, we didn't uh, attempt to <laughs> overcome that to speak of. <laughs> um, in my case, they were, I think, upset that I didn't use the uh, Fritchie so-called confession right. in my presentation, and they did use it when they got to cross-examine uh, Fritchie. And of course, Fritchie said, look, I made this under duress. I was extremely upset. Uh, Berlin had just fallen. They'd, I'd been one of the first that they'd grabbed hold of, and, and I'd just signed anything they put in front of me. Right. So I was glad I hadn't used it. <laughs> I, uh, Bernie Meltzer was telling about a party of which the Russians had or where a Mickey Mouse watch was, was given to Robert Jackson. Were you, were you there at that time? You know? No. Okay, well, then no need to get into it if you weren't there because it was one of those funny Russian stories. Can I go back to sure, the... Go, dive right in, Jeff, because I'm going to go on to the subsequent okay. proceedings. I, I wanted to ask about the the Ribbentrop examination and that, that handoff. Was was that just Jackson at low ebb, and did he kind of bounce back as, as you observed him? Oh, yes. <clears throat> uh, I think he was emotionally disturbed by his reputation and all around the Gehring uh, examination. Which, right. But I think he soon recovered from that because it, it, everybody felt that he was the main pusher to have the war crimes trials <coughs> at, at the London, London negotiations in July and August and September of 1945, that he was the main person who got the French and the later the Russians to join up with us. Uh, he was the number one man uh, in Nuremberg, right. <laughs> in everybody's opinion. Now, in in April of '46, Chief Justice Stone drops dead here in Washington, and Truman eventually passes over Jackson, basically, and appoints Vinson. Uh, was that any kind of a big deal in Nuremberg? Was anybody paying attention to the Supreme Court? No. Okay. Not that I know of. Right? Okay. Um, and then Jackson kind of publicly lashed out at Justice Black in the context of this thing and caused a real storm over here. Was that? We heard about something about it, but uh, I don't even think it was in the Stars and Stripes okay. in the newspapers or anything like that. Okay. But we did hear that he and Black had had a bad word or two. How did you get your media? Did you read the 
when you, when you were reading the newspaper headlines, was it Stars and Stripes? Was it the German paper? What during most of the trial, what was the principal source of media coverage? Stars and Stripes. Stars and Stripes. Uh, most of the Americans didn't read enough German to to uh, <laughs> pay attention to the German newspapers. I uh, now and then got a copy and <coughs> and glanced through it. My German was not perfect. I'd had three and a half years in college, but still it wasn't perfect. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so we didn't pay too much attention to it, except that. I think there was some kind of report about how the, the trials were being reported, uh, and that there was a decline here and something or other there, but not much more. Yeah. Right. Now, you said you had relatively infrequent contacts with Jackson. Yes. How how regular were your contacts with Bill? With Bill uh, Jackson. With Bill Jackson. Well, you know, there was no regularity about it, but. Okay. Whenever he <coughs> and he wrote one of the prefaces, incidentally, right. to, right. My, to my book. Yes. Uh, whenever he had something that he wanted to get for Jackson, or whenever I wanted to try to get some Jackson to know uh, some little thing, I'd go to Bill and he would fix it. And uh, he was very much a fellow who didn't attempt to appear important, and yet he did handle a tremendous number of interactions with Jackson and other people that was important. Mm -hmm. Did did people resent him in any way because he was the boss's kid, you know, that kind of? I, I never have had any evidence of that. Okay. I think uh, most of us were just glad he was there because okay. it, 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 it was an easier way for us to get Right. To make an impact if we had to on Jackson. Right. Okay. I had an opportunity to talk to one of the participants of Nuremberg, not on an attorney basis, but the uh, bodyguard, Moritz Fuchs. Uh, yes. He's in near lives near Syracuse and uh, is well doing well. And I, I don't did you see him frequently around? Jackson's bodyguard at all? Yes, he was, he'd be around. Yep. <laughs> he was very capable at not being apparent. He was, he was, I can still see them getting ready. Jackson and what was her name, his uh, secretary? Elsie. Elsie May. Uh, I can still see them getting in his car to go off and he would always stand off to the side and wait till they were in and he'd go in sit in the front seat with the chauffeur. He was a very decent guy. We became a Catholic priest. Yes. I didn't know him, of course, after that, after the trial. But we're hoping that he will come to Jamestown in a couple of months. Uh, he just retired as a priest up in Hannibal, New York, which is near Syracuse. Uh, and he really hasn't had a, any reason to or any chance to talk about Nuremberg or Jackson. But he's going to come and, and talk oh, about Oh, good, it. good for you. Yeah. So we're kind of excited about somebody who, uh, who obviously knew him better than any of us over there uh, because he was with him every day. Yeah, of course. So you just mentioned uh, Elsie Douglas. Did you have much dealing with her? No. She'd now and then call me up if uh, she had something that, that she didn't handle through Bill Jackson. And... Um, Actually, after we got back here in the States, uh, and I was working on these volumes, I went over to see her uh, as the editor-in-chief of the later volumes. Mm -hmm. Went over to see her a time or two, and we had her here. She sat right there, I happen to remember. She really? sat right to where you're sitting. Okay. When uh, we had her here a time or two. Okay. This okay. is in the, the years shortly after Nuremberg, or much later? Both. Both, uh, yeah, okay. There was, uh, I, I called on her several times. Uh, connection with just being a friend and, right. and well, down at her place and she came here. And when you were working on your book you were dealing with her? Yeah. Okay. Did you? Not much but a little bit. Did you do any interviewing of of her or other people? I mean, you know, notes or tapes or? 
that kind of stuff? No. If I had a question, I'd call her up or something, okay. but I don't remember it. Okay. Okay. Um, there was no no stiffness in our relationship. Right. So right. She was just a, f a friend. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and we all admired her for the work she did. Obviously, he relied on uh, Jackson relied on her very much, and uh, she was not a. Uh, she, uh, she didn't try to be pushy or to enlarge her mm -hmm. uh, status or anything like that. She was very decent, right? Reserved woman, right? And and an ace secretary is is the sense I get. What's right? that? A, a real crackerjack yeah, secretary. Absolutely. Um, a woman named Jean McFetridge, did you know her? Yes, but I can't put together just how. Tell me something. Well, I think she was pretty young. I think she did secretarial work maybe for Bill. I think she was kind of part of that inner office. But I don't know much more about her. Her name comes up, and I'm trying to learn a little more about her. I can't help you. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, what about... Alma or Alma Sollers. Yeah. Uh, Alma Soller and I worked together on something or other, but damn if I can remember the details. But I did get to know her better than Jean McFetridge, for example. Okay. Was Alma over there or was she back here when the when the publications were being done after the after the different rounds of the trials? I think back here under Dick Olbetter. Okay. Dick Olbetter was the uh, <coughs> main fellow back here <coughs> in 1948 and 49 when I was finishing up the editing on the green volumes. Okay. Um, what about Roger Barrett? Did yeah, I can still see his face. Uh, just known as a able uh, trial attorney, and I think he presented the case against somebody or other, but I don't know who. Okay. Um, Very decent fella. Okay. Um, Dick Sonnenfeld? Dick Sonnenfeld. Again, a familiar name. Right. I can't uh, Interpreter. Young. young Kid, kid, mm -hmm. really. German-born, uh, refugee, became, I think, army and OSS, and yeah. you know, soldier, and then got yeah. got back to Nuremberg, and I, I think an interpreter. was, I think was an interpreter for for the American prosecution group. Does that help you? No, I I just know that he was one of the German-speaking, okay. able guys that we had. Okay. That did something or other. It's okay. important, but I don't I, seg I don't okay. separate it out in my mind anymore. Okay. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's that's great. I just wanted to sort of yeah. toss the names out because I run across them in my research, and you can you oh, know. It's amazing, amazing that you know all these names. Well, <clears throat> is Bill William Baldwin still alive? As the last I heard, he was, but I haven't been in touch with him for a couple of years. Okay. No, that's not so. Bill Baldwin is in Florida, and you wrote to him not a month ago. There you go. <laughs> Where are in Florida? Do Thank you, you, Virginia. No, but he's got a file on him. Okay. okay. Of the guys... You want you want his address or something? Well, when we get done, if we could. All right. Uh, of the attorneys who were on the, uh, uh, basically, on the podium, Baldwin, to your knowledge, he's alive. Um, we know Whitney, Brady, and Bernie are, I'm going to go through just some names quickly, and I'm, uh, I'm assuming they're, they're passed away. Wheeler? As I, I'm almost positive he passed away some years ago. James Donovan? <coughs> Jim Donovan. Jim Donovan? Wallace? These are guys that you probably haven't had contact with. Yeah, but I don't remember uh, is, when he, uh, anything about when he passed away. Or is Walter Brudno still alive? Brudno. Brudno. I don't know. Kepner? 
No, Kempner's dead. Uh, three, four Bruno years ago. Is in St. Louis. What's that? I think Walter Bruno is in St. Louis, and I think he is still alive. We know, I know Whitney Harris is in St. Louis. Do you think Bruno's still there? You're also there. Okay. Uh, we're in fact we, we our source of information. I want you to know is your 1991. Uh, directory, uh, yeah. which you gave to James Conway. I assume you gave it to a lot of people, but James Conway sent it to us. Oh, good. So we thank you indirectly through James <laughs> Conway. <laughs> good. That, that, that's how we tracked down Brady Bryson, and that's why we're here today because we I wanted to have a chance to talk to you and, and to Brady. Well, I uh, I appreciate being interviewed. You certainly have done your homework uh, getting ready for well you gave us you gave us a good encyclopedia yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you did our homework if we, if we read it <laughs> we're ready um, I, unrelated I noticed in Joe Persico's book he talks about you being the assistant I uh, served as deputy chairman of the Democratic Party when was that between 1957 and 1960 mm -hmm. when uh, Kennedy was elected president. I was deputy chairman of the Democratic National Committee. That's a great way to go out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you you were when you got done with um, obviously Nuremberg came back to practice law. You were active in the Democratic Party. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Virginia and I were both active. We had a farm out near Potomac and. We stirred up the Democrats, and I became head of the Potomac Democratic Club, and, and uh, I don't know what else. And one day, a guy by the name of Bill Sturdivant saw me, and he said, I've just been offered a job as head of the small business division <coughs> at the Democratic National Committee, but I can't accept the job. So. Um, he says, you're a small businessman. <laughs> Actually, I was just a small farmer at the time. So I went into uh, the National Committee, and I just went to, up to Butler's secretary and said, I understand that the, the chairman, Butler, he's the chairman of the Democratic National Committee. And I said, I understand that uh, he's uh, de uh, developing a small business division, and I thought he might want to talk to me. And he talked to me for a half hour and he hired me right on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Those things that happen awful fast. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, when I, I, I worked in 1956 then with Senator Sparkman and Wright Patman uh, from the Hill, right. uh, and we had an advisory committee, and it uh, pleased Chairman Paul Butler very much. So when uh, the campaign started to, wait, to begin early. I stopped by to see Butler in 57, and again he hired me the same damn. No, no, he didn't. He said, We're planning on having an advisory committee for the whole organization, and we, in fact, have selected some people for it. And Neil Stabler, the state chairman in Michigan, is the main guy. I couldn't, uh, wouldn't want you to think that I could uh, hire you or anybody else without. So you go out and visit him in Michigan. So I did. He called together his state committee, and we had lunch together and so on. And that afternoon, as I was sitting in Stabler's office, he called up Butler and he said, "Hire him." <laughs> <laughs> and so I was employed as the. Uh, and I had six regional representatives around the country, right. and I worked with them in terms of what, how they should interact with different state chairmen, chair women, and uh, it did help organize the uh, party very much. It was just, Butler was quick to say that, that the party was strengthened by the work of the six regional representatives out there on a year-round basis. Uh, a lot more than by the official meetings, right. Mm -hmm. right. which is true. Were you active at the actual convention? Uh, 
1960 I'm talking about. Right? Yeah, uh, well, y yes and no. I was asked to speak, and I talked about the field service program, and I introduced each of the six uh, regional representatives, and uh, they asked them to make a brief statement, which they did on some aspect of our work. Uh, that was, I would think, the main thing I did at the 60 convention, except that uh, I, I had a large room, and it was almost used as a meeting place for a lot of people during the day. So I had to get up and clean up in the morning, <laughs> be ready for right. people stopping by. And uh, it was kind of a second headquarters, you might say. And one where things weren't as stiff as they were at the right. at the, uh, the office outside Butler's Butler's office. You a Kennedy man? Uh, no, I was a um, a Humphrey man. Mm -hmm. But we had to be very reserved. We weren't allowed to, of course, have any open position about sure. this. Sure. Uh, in our in our spot, we had to indicate that we could take no position whatsoever, right. and I, I don't recall that I ever had any, any problem with that. Mm -hmm. um, one time I was called down to Kennedy's office, and uh, who the hell was his main deputy then? He was interviewing me, <coughs> and he said, don't you think you could give a little help, uh, a little us a little more help than the others? Uh, I, uh, and I said, uh, well, no, I, I don't think so. And he was trying to draw me out as to my own detailed personal position, and I just refused to be drawn very far. Right. Um, Bobby Kennedy uh, called me, and, and, and Bob uh, and uh, John Sparkman, uh, Brightman, the head of the, uh, the other deputy, there were two deputy chairmen, and one was for public relations and one for political organization. And we went down to see uh, Bobby Kennedy in uh, an office he had, and he said to me, uh, Sprecher, can you do a little bit more to have your regional representatives work on the big cities rather than on the smaller states and, uh, <laughs> and so on? Because uh, that was obviously suggesting that he knew that Kennedy was stronger in the cities than he was in the countryside. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, well, we'll have do both, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you did now, that after the 60 campaign came and went, the Democrats are in power. Were you given an opportunity to stay on either in the party or in government in any way? Ralph Dungan <clears throat> was one of uh, the Kennedy team that was very important. And uh, I hear I had been deputy chair and I came into my office after the convention, and my stuff had all been shoved out onto the floor. And uh, What's that one of one of uh, Kennedy's top men had taken over the office next to Butler's. And uh, uh, so I took my stuff up and packed off. Ralph Dungan, who became a uh, one of the main assistants to Kennedy in the White House called me over and said, uh, why don't you st just stick around here for a while, I think I can find something for you to do. And since I'd had so much to do dealing with the state chairman and all that, he said, I think what you should can do is, we have a lot of requests for endorsements by, from Kennedy uh, to particular candidates, and we don't want to give any out if they're going to hurt Kennedy in any way. Right. So I had to check every one of the requests for endorsement, except for Massachusetts, where Bob Kennedy <laughs> <laughs> took care of that. Right, they could handle that without yeah. your, your uh, screening. And uh, when, um, after I'd done all that, I sat right outside the Dungan's office. After I'd done that, he asked me to come into the White House to be one of his assistants. And by that time, I had agreed to establish a leadership training company with several other people, and I had to turn that down. It may have been a big mistake, but that's what I did. Okay. You didn't miss it after that? 
Oh, I of course I got a lot of calls from people like Dungan and uh, so on on what would I do in certain circumstances, or what was my advice, and I did that kind of thing off the record and uh, gladly. Mm -hmm. uh, having been deputy chair for <clears throat> three years uh, and having had this field staff, I, I did know a great deal about the details of right. particular squabbles in particular states and and so on. Tell me a little bit, now I'm going to go back a little bit. Uh, Nuremberg trials are over, they're the, for trial, the first main trial is over, and you reflect back on what was the legacy of that trial and maybe the subsequent trials insofar as we look at today's world. Well, it was the first time <coughs> that uh, f four principal nations got together and decided that they would create an instrument to enforce international law. And uh, of course we claimed that international law had been established for a long time, when we went way back to the Hague and Geneva Conventions and <coughs> so on. but. It hadn't had too much to do with respect to uh, indicting a whole uh, top hierarchy of a, a regime, such as the Nazis. So um, historically, we relied mainly on uh, these the conventions uh, and the Kellogg-Briand Pact, mm -hmm. called the Pact Against War. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt was really a, uh, an incredible person throughout a, a number of these years. She uh, was the eyes and ears for uh, FDR in lots of ways. And uh, uh, at the 1956 convention, I think, yeah, else is 1960. Uh, I, 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 Paul Butler asked me to to uh, accompany the uh, important people who were going to be brought out and talk to the entire convention. Oh, wow. So uh, Eleanor Roosevelt showed up in that room waiting to be let out, and we talked quite a bit, and there was. The Stevenson people put on a tremendous demonstration carrying Adley on their shoulders and took over the hall and all that kind of thing. And uh, I went up to the governor who was acting as the chairman of the, uh, the, the, uh, of the whole convention at that moment. And I said, how about if I brought Eleanor Roosevelt out here? Don't you think it would stop this celebration and we could get on with the thing? <laughs> oh, wonderful idea. So I went out and, and told her that we thought her presence would stop this thing, that the convention ought to get on. She said, I think it should get on too. I don't know why Adley, who I'm going to support, uh, allows this kind of thing. Well, of course, whether he Adley planned it or didn't plan it, it was going on. And um, so I brought her out, and immediately the hall quieted down and so on. And um, she said, I have come here to endorse Adelie Stevenson, and I think and so on and so on, and she spoke for him. And she says, and then I want to say something else. I think that the demonstration you've been holding is out of place, and that the convention business must go on, and I beg you personally to see that you don't resume this uh, stomping around in the uh, thing. I did it. <laughs> did you see Jackson after Nuremberg in his remaining years in Washington? Uh, yes, but very seldom. Uh, maybe, <coughs> maybe two or three times. For example, uh, I took him the first copy of one of these green volumes which had been printed by the government printing office 
<coughs> the later trials, and I just took him a copy of it as a gift, you might say. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, that's, I'm great to, glad to see that you're getting something out about these. I'll, I will read it. I never had any further reports from him on it, but... Mm -hmm. uh, that was it. You went to his chambers at the court? Yes, at the court. Uh, to his, his private, to his right. private chambers. So maybe two or three times. And uh, that's about it. I Did he ever have a reunion of the staff while he was alive? No. No. Did you ever read much about his reflections? That, did he reflect on it all? Or was it over and done and let history make a decision about the effectiveness of Nuremberg? Well, of course, he made a final report to the president at the time. Right. Uh, and <coughs> indicated that he was turning things over to General Telford Taylor, who became his successor. Taylor also wrote a final report at which he mentions Jackson quite a bit, of course, because Jackson uh, used him in the first trial for several different reasons, including he was the most informed person about the German high command mm -hmm. of anybody. Mm -hmm. Was there any tension or complex feeling between Jackson and Taylor? That you were privy to, either. No, I was, if there was any, I didn't know about it. Okay. <coughs> uh, uh, Taylor's book is not entirely complimentary, um, as I read it. It's got a little bit of a an edge. And about Jackson. About Jackson. I didn't recall that, but the, the okay. reading the book, the Anatomy of the Nuremberg Trial. Right. right. <coughs> I didn't recall that. That doesn't mean it isn't there. Right, right. Uh, I mean, it also says very complimentary really things has, in, in yeah. many places, but uh, and it may just be that where Taylor makes a critical comment, Jackson deserves it. Um, so I'm not impugning Taylor. Oh, so, okay. you know, right. You know, you really are to be congratulated for doing this. Because well, I think for, for years to come, this will be the source book, uh, because it's laid out so logically uh, throughout the trial. 122 uh, chapters. Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, it really is a terrific uh, labor of love to, to have that for, for posterity. It's the Drexel Sprecher legacy. Well, thank you. Thank you, and I <coughs> appreciate that. Was there anyone who you were corresponding with during the IMP, IMT trial? I guess you were single, so you weren't, you know, you weren't writing letters to a wife or something, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, did you? I was. I was married. Or you were married? Yes, okay. that was my my first marriage. Okay. Okay. Um, do you have any any things from that time? Letters you wrote or any notes you might have kept? You know, as opposed to your yeah. Writing after the fact, anything contemporaneous. I, I think I have some <coughs> letters that I sent to my folks that I picked up after a while when right. I came back, okay. <coughs> and some things like that. The um, when we moved from <coughs> the farm that we had near Potomac down to Bethesda to a home we had. I shipped a tremendous number of six or seven crates of stuff to the John F. Kennedy Center in Boston. Okay. And uh, I went up there a couple of years later to see what they'd done with it. My God, they'd organized it beautifully, much better than I had. Yeah. And uh, they sent somebody down to interview me. And then uh, I later sent them some other stuff uh, to fortify, to give their, they really spent money and right. had staff galore. That they had. And does that include Nuremberg? Or is that the later DNC period? Yeah, DNC period, doesn't it? I knew nothing about Kennedy at Nuremberg. Right, no, I, 
but I was wondering if they might have been interested because it's part of your biography. If they, you know, interviewed you about Nuremberg, or if you would have deposited Nuremberg things there. Um, no, they mainly asked me about relationships between Taylor and other people and a few general things and so on. It wasn't, right. it wasn't right. a great uh, historical contribution. Right. Do, do you remember, did Eleanor Roosevelt ever stop by Nuremberg in, in 45 or 46? No. Okay. No. Drexel, what haven't we asked you that we should be asking? <laughs> <laughs> What's the question that we're saying? Boy, they should have asked that one. No, I think you've done an extremely good job. I was just looking at my notes here that the things I wanted to mention to you, and you've covered every one of them. Huh? Well, well, you know we're you know we're gonna walk out of here and we're gonna walk out of here and say, "Gee, we forgot to ask him." Talk <laughs> about just just quickly. You were there for this subsequent trials, right? And there were twelve, as I recall, twelve and all. You're right. Now, your role during that period of time was was it principally administrative, or were you did you actually um, prosecute those cases? Any of those cases? Uh, both. Both. Yeah, I I was the main prosecutor. <clears throat> In the IG Farben case, <clears throat> I sat in, in the courthouse for most of the whole year that that damn trial went on. Uh, <clears throat> uh, actually, I had a deputy chief counsel come in and after the indictment had been issued and all, Joe Du Bois, who theoretically was between me and Telford Taylor, but uh, he never <clears throat> interposed to speak of. And we got on very well, and I, everybody knew I was handling the trial in court, and he was handling things like helping write a new statement on some <coughs> point or so on. He's a very smart guy. Uh, the uh, so that one trial, that one thing was where I was, uh, I was the uh, head of the trial team. Right. Now, apart from that, I, when Penny France turned down the job of being head of publications, uh, Telford immediately came to me and asked me to take that up. And so I had a staff of as many as 30 people, half of whom were Germans, uh, over there collecting the materials which you get into, got into, eventually got into these 15 mm -hmm. green volumes you see right. behind me. Right. Right. Uh, and uh, during the last uh, six months of the trials, Telford went back to the States to get ready to file his report and also to try to settle things in his marriage with, with Mary Taylor. They, they weren't getting on well and they had right. divorced later. And uh, so that left me in charge and I was a uh, not only deputy chief counsel, but acting chief counsel in Nuremberg on a number of things. And Taylor and I never had any squabbles about my performance of that job. Right. And uh, I always tried to boost him as much as I, I could. I made the final statement to the tribunal uh, to in the ministry's case, the <coughs> prosecution's rebuttal statement right. at the end of the trial. The last words of the prosecution spoken in Nuremberg, and uh, he was very um, appreciative of uh, what I had done and yeah. congratulated me on that final statement. Uh, after um, he's up there in New York and he separated from Mary, and I went up to see him a time or two. Uh, I was the chair of putting on the three Nuremberg Unions, the chair of the right. committee, mm -hmm. and uh, we got him to speak 
at each one of those. At the last one, he was getting to the point where he was not very able at speaking. And uh, he used to call me from time to time and just speak about nothing in particular, right. just kind of for old time's sake. Uh, what, what were the dates of the three reunion? What what years? Do you remember what uh, which anniversaries they fell on? Uh, well, one was ninety one, one was ninety six. Virginia. Don't ask me. I don't remember. <laughs> uh, one was ninety six. One was ninety one. I don't know what the third when the third one was. Which were it was in between or what? All right. I do remember ninety one, ninety six. Right. We had over our, well over a hundred people at each one of those, right. and uh, they received a fair amount of attention right. in the press. Right. Now I've seen National Law Journal and other mm -hmm. other yeah. stories. Good, good sure. coverage. We're very proud of that. Right. right. Congratulations. Just getting everybody together. Right. <laughs> Did you do any taping or videotaping at any of those events, or was any of that uh, recorded? There, there was taping uh, of almost everything at. Uh, some of them, and I helped arrange <coughs> for, I can still remember a woman who squatted down on the floor, and very good, I forget her name. I mean, Nora O'Connell videotaped the last one totally. Yes, I think that's true. She later became a part-time secretary to me, too. So it might be possible to get a copy of that tape, maybe, for archiving. What did she tend to do with it, just for her own sake, or archives, or do you know? I think we've got it around here somewhere, but I don't know where. We've got so many different tapes. Yeah. If I find it, I can send it to you. Oh, no, oh. Terrific. You'd like, you, you'd like to have a tape of? Yeah. One of the, uh, a part of the reunion. Yeah. I kind of believe somewhere in that tape they talked about Jackson. You know. I think um, Telford talked about Jackson. Yeah. I mean, I, the general seaman. I mean, the whole thing would be interesting, but certainly within that is probably some stuff very relevant for us. Some nuggets on, you know, maybe you or Bill or Telford or. Um, Whitney Harris. <clears throat> I don't know if it was the last reunion or the second reunion. But Whitney Harris <coughs> asked, to, to, and I wanted to ask him anyway, to, to make a talk on Jackson. Tomorrow. Okay. Nine and he made a beautiful uh, praise of Jackson and went into, quoted some of the beginnings of Jackson's statements, which were so wonderful. Sure. And uh, then I followed him and, and made the same kind of a thing for Telford Taylor, right. the successor. Right. So, and they complimented each other very well. That'd be very interesting to, to uh, see. I have not attempted to see if I use those, find those tapes or ever right. play them again. Right. Well, well, it's one of those things. Once you get it, you just put it over in a corner. Yeah. And you. So somebody asked for it, but right. I won't see it. But it, I, it's it's here somewhere. Um, that's this phenomenal, Drexel. Thank you. This has been terrific. I got to get your autograph in your book here, though. Me too. This is your. No, that was your uncle Drexel. He's going to call back in an hour. Where do you want me to scribe it here? Wherever you wherever you normally do it. I think on the first page, but. I'm not sure you want to have the, the volume ruined. Oh, no, no. Are you kidding me? This would be terrific. <laughs> ruin. Ruin. Are you kidding me? It's about to escalate in, right. in historical importance. I'll just say inscribed for Greg Peterson. That'd be terrific. This is a day we'll remember. Well, you honor me a great deal. No, you honor us, permitting us to do this.
Direct Specker or Direct Soleil? Whatever you normally say. Direct is fine. Can I ask for a, oh, I love a similar treatment? I've already defaced this page by writing my own name on it, so you can write I'll there deface, or... I'll deface it more. Okay, that's great. <coughs> John Barrett with two R's and two T's. Two R's. Two R's. I'm glad you. And just just like Roger Barrett, although we're not related. B A R R E T T. Right. Uh huh. Just, here are the case of that reading. Mm -hmm. If you, well, it was 96, it was the last one. Um, you want to take these with you? I'll make copies and send them back. Uh, what what did you got there? She found the tapes. The tapes of the reunion. No, that I'd be happy to do. Be sure you send them back. Oh, absolutely. Um, you'll find some blank spaces where um, she had to turn and face into the, you hear the voice. But oh, you sure. Don't see the person, but you'll know who it is. Right. And uh, well, she was an amateur. She wasn't a professional. Right. No. This, we all are in our own way. You have two R's and two T's. Right. Barrett. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me give you my card. Okay. Yeah. This has just been, you've been extraordinary. Listen, I, I'm concerned. Uh,